disciplines of grace is a good, good phrase. Uh, grace is a freely given by our God and absolutely free. Uh, the very definition of grace means that, but anybody who receives the love of God is going to understand that love to be something that grows in our hearts, and those are the disciplines. And so we're going to look at one today that was assigned to me on listening to God, and I said to Jeff, oh no, please don't give that to me. Uh, and I told him how I'd approach it and the verses, and he said, please do, listening to God. So for the next 30 minutes, just take time to listen. No, I'll go ahead and preach. But that would be the easy way out, and uh, it's an area, I was a pastor 43 years and now coach of pastors for 10, and it's one of the areas of great confusion and heresy and selfishness and one of the great gifts of God for us, too. So my normal way as a kid would always be to say, Lord, please speak to me, and then he hands me the Bible. That's the way I would have explained it. I've been around and walked with Christ long enough that I know there's more to it, and I'd like to look at that with you. If you'd like to, we're going to look at the story first, and there's an outline in your, that you might have if you picked it up on, so you know about when I'm going to be done. Uh, I'll be done right when we get to the third part of the sentence. The first part is we respond to God's voice, or we should respond to God's voice. That's the issue. And this is 1 Samuel, an assigned topic, uh, scripture, and one of the most beautiful there is. If you grew up in Sunday school, you know the story. Samuel's sleeping in the temple, actually. Now, this is not the temple, but I've seen a lot of people do what Samuel was doing, sleeping in the church, and it's okay. But he's sleeping, and he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. He thinks it's the priest, the one he's serving, uh, Eli. So in verse 4, the Lord called Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, the Lord called Samuel and said, here I, and, and Samuel said, here I am, and ran to Eli. Now that happened three times. Samuel, Samuel, he always runs to the high priest, Eli. And Eli says, I didn't call you. No, I didn't call you. But now we get down to verse 9, excuse me, 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. It's a great sentence to memorize, by the way. So Samuel went and lay down at his place, and the Lord came. Now watch this. The Lord came and stood, calling, so his presence is there, theophany we call it, appearance of God before Jesus came to earth. As at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, and he gave a a word of what's going to happen in Israel and some of the sin that was around. That's the story. Any questions? (laughs) Well, there it is. Samuel said what we should say, an overriding idea, Speak, Lord, When you speak, Lord, your servant hears. Today we will, if you wish, uh, participate in communion. God has spoken what communion means. Now we say, I get it, and I will hear you. In this case, though, Samuel, out of the blue, is called by God. His direct voice to Samuel. I hope you believe that. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a myth. It's God speaking directly. Can he do that today? Of course he can. But he did it very directly in that day. Now, what is his word to us today? I'm sure some of us would choose Samuel, and I think that's a good wish, but I personally think you'll be disappointed. I know God can pronounce the name Newt, but I've never heard it like that, like Samuel, or I've never seen the Lord standing there and talking to me. 
This was a very different event, very real, but it's a model for us to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. No matter how you view listening to God, you've got to take these next three points as strong on the voice of God. I want to give them to you in a bit of a summary of how God speaks. This is one of the most gorgeous and plain and openly powerful psalms in the book. Psalm 19. Talk about going outside. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. I believe God said, let there be light, and there was light by the word of his power, because he said it, it is so. Next verse. Day to day points out, pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Something comes out of the heavens that says, you ought to look there. You ought to see this. You ought to think who made this. Verse 3. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no language, no Arabic, no Russian, no Chinese, no American, English. He speaks in every voice, and when we look at the heavens, we should go, oh, for the word is loud and clear. In the sun that rises every day, they tell us in Michigan exactly what time it's coming up. Comes up later, this place, only a different time zone. How does that happen? Because of design, of God's revolve, yes, revolving the world. And, and the, the amazing, we ought to look at it and not just say, that's a pretty sunset, isn't it? You see that sunset? Yeah, it's very nice. Rainbow, very nice. No, we should go, oh, I worship you. The speech is, Look what I've made. And human beings, his highest creation, by the way, is you. We should not just take this for granted that we can think and sit here and stand here and talk and have logic and believe and have emotions. This is the work of a creator God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom. Any questions? The speech is, the loudest speech of any that I give, creation. And the sad thing is, grandparents may be more in this more than parents, more than kids, but it's true. Creation, the two great works of God, and salvation, you can't talk about in most schoolrooms, and many families never mention them. But the first shout of God, he screams with genius. The flower, the human being, and all that he's made. Do you believe that? Do you rest in that? The creator of the universe. The second way he shouts, clearly, and at, at Chapel Street here, I pastored at the chapel. You stole our name and combined it with street which I think is a great name, the chapel's on the street. People are living it out. But we believe this, it's in your statement of faith, I looked it up again, the inspired word of God. Second Timothy 3 says it's profitable, it's given by God, it's God-breathed. That's hard to accept. That God guided these people as they wrote it. We believe that. First Peter chapter 1 says that they were moved along like a sailboat moved by the wind. You don't have to believe that to attend here, but you're going to hear it preached here. We should read it. The second way that God speaks so loudly is through his word. There's parts of it I find confusing. I'm sure you do too. There's parts of it I don't understand sometimes. But the word shows us what God is like it tells us how to live, how to love, how to forgive, how to be married or single. 
In the Word of God, we learn what love is and how we can be kinder to people and how a church should operate. It tells us how we should live with people who offend us and make us mad. That's one of the disciplines we looked at last week, obeying. The Word of God is from God, obviously. I don't know if you believe that. If you do, you got to read it <laughs> and see what it says and obey it. You do, don't you? A third way that God shouts and his word, that's my assignment, how do we respond to his word, is Jesus. John chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, it says, in the beginning was, the, sounds like Genesis, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word is the logos. We find out from a further study later that the, there's a trinity, God Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Word is the Son. He's the expression of God. You want to see what He looks like? You want to see what God wants to say to us? Look at Jesus. Born in the manger, that little baby, that little hand that once scooped dust and made a human being now is barely a half inch or an inch wide, a voice that once once called into existence the world, now cries. By the way, when you sing away in a manger, never sing no crying he makes. Just go, mm -hmm, mm hmm Sure he cried. He was a human being. He speaks as a baby and then grows up, but that's God. The center of Converge, the center of Chapel Street, the center of our heart should be that the Word, John 1, 14, was made flesh and dwelt among us, lived right beside me, lived right beside you, that kind of thing. He loved people of all sizes and shapes. Children would run to sit on his lap. The lepers had a saying among them, he's one of us. Not because he healed all of them, but because he loved all of them and touched them. In the forgiveness that he showed, he showed us how to live. In the hell that he endured, he showed us how to get to heaven. He dies with all our sins on his back, every one of them. He is the Word of God. I hope you listen to him. The fourth way that God speaks, guidance. And here we have 17 different camps all in this church. I won't ask you to identify, and I made up the number 17, but there's many different opinions. In college, when we were at college, uh, some friends are here that will remember the guy that went up to a girl and said, God told me I should marry you. It wasn't me, it wasn't Chuck. She said, when he tells me, I'll go ahead with it. <laughs> what is guidance? Listening to the voice of God. The trumpet solo said, and he walks with me and he talks with me. What does that mean? And how do I respond to that? And as a pastor, I know at least 30, 40, 50 times somebody said to me, God told me to tell you this. One of them was my wife. I'm just kidding. No. How do you handle this? And I, I, I typed in. I'm very techy. I can type. I can Google. Listening to the voice of God. There are more articles about that, I think, than studying the Bible. How to hear God's voice clearly. Sean Bowles teaches how to hear God's voice. A long article was 11 ways on how to hear God's voice more clearly through your spirit, circumstances, dreams, visions, the pastor, thank you, audible voice, remembrance, and prophecy. One book that I have with me in the car is God Told Me to Write This Book 
by a very good pastor in Grand Rapids. Bill Hybels wrote the book, The Whispers of God. A wonderful pastor in Washington, D.C. has a book called Whisper, The Voice of God. And if you read them and hear others, what is clear is that God talks to people, and some of them, all the time. What should we expect, and how should we respond? Well, the Bible is clear about this. Ask for wisdom. James, one of the chapters in one of the books, said, quoted James chapter 1, if any man lacks, lacks, lacks wisdom or cannot speak right, let him ask of God if you lack wisdom. And his conclusion was, God will tell you what to do. My conclusion is he will give you wisdom so you choose carefully. You have to decide. But the issue is, how does God lead us and how does he communicate with us? Can God speak out loud in our head? Absolutely. Can he tell a pilot to turn? I read the story of it down in uh, New Guinea. Turn and go to a destination he was never thinking about. And he got there as, in his small plane and a man needed to be rushed to the hospital by plane. He was the only plane. Can God do that? Of course. But what is the norm? If you're a pilot, file a flight plan. Head a certain way. Obey the laws. What should we expect in our personal lives? Does the Holy Spirit, if you're in Christ, you're combined with the Holy Spirit like this? Does he guide us and give us wisdom? Absolutely. But is it a voice that tells us every decision? That's the question that some of these people that wrote the articles must grapple with. They would say yes. One book says, God told me who to marry. James Emery White, a very good pastor in Charlotte, wrote an article just last week. I got it Friday. Some people would say that's a sign of what I should say today. I said, that's a nice coincidence. And James Emery White said, God told me to leave the music ministry and become a pastor. God told me to write this book. God told me to start a church in Mecklenburg. Called okay, there's many of us that God never told us, but we felt it was the right thing to do. The question is, how does God dot, guide us? I want to give one other passage and then answer that question as I understand it. You'll have to decide. John chapter 10. In John chapter 10 is a reminder, and I wanted to give this as a caution, that there are many voices in all our heads, and especially in the newspaper, and especially in our neighborhood, and especially in the grade schools. And many of them are other lords. Many people calling for attention of Christians. I have voices in my head all the time. So do you. Question, when is it God? When is it God's spirit? We must be careful. John chapter 10, it's our Lord Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a robber. There's, there's people that are trying to steal Christians or steal unbelievers to a cult, to, a, to a, an addiction. Verse 2. But the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. That's Jesus. To him the gatekeeper opens the door. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And in three chapters I read about these verses, not from the Bible, but from the books that I gathered on the voice of God. It was, you'll know the voice of God. You know what he sounds like in your head, and you know the type of thing he says. 
These are cultic leaders. These are Jewish leaders who didn't want the new Jew, Jesus. These are people, you, you ask somebody you know who's addicted by drugs or sex or power, and he'll admit it's a Lord. There are other lords, small l. In verse 5, Jesus says, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. That should be true in our lives, that we know what is the voice of God. And I want to urge us, without any question, hear the voice of God in creation. Don't just look at a sunrise or the stars or a human being created by God. Worship him. Go, oh, hear the voice of God in Scripture. He speaks from Genesis on to Revelation. Hear the voice of God in Jesus Christ especially. The other voices try to decide what's a good word that I just heard. One time, Janine and I were in Alaska, speaking at Alaska Bible College, and one of the profs there asked me if I wanted to ride a sled with, pulled by huskies. I said, of course. So I sat in the sled, and he, met, I said, he said, do you want to try it? I said, sure. Well, when, I, when he sat in the sled and I got back there, I had a long whip, didn't know how to do that, but I said, mush. And all the dogs, seven of them, turned around like this. <laughs> I heard one of them say, who are you? <laughs> we had uh, at Akron 60-second uh, spots on local TV, and one time a man in our church had, uh, trained Belgian horses, and I asked if we could do a spot with his horses. Sure. So they're plowing, two huge. You've seen Belgian horses. They're beautiful. He trained them. So I get behind the plow, and he told me what to say. Oh, I forget what it was. I knew, what, I knew it that day, but when I said it, there was no movement, no concern at all. Their ears were just looped down. If you're married, you've had that happen. <laughs> I said, Ron, I can't do this. So we've worked it out where his voice, he, whatever it was, as soon as he said it, their ears went straight up. They started plowing, and it worked. But a stranger, I need to know what's a strange voice in my life. There's voices in your heart that will say, get even. Say this back to him or her. You know it. You know it. There's voices that in the newspaper, there's voices on the news that would be like, there's no way we can do what's right or obey the Lord. The good shepherd is the one whose voice we hear, first of all, in Scripture in our hearts by His Spirit, and we affirm it by believing and walking with Him. Is that you? The Good Shepherd, a few verses later, 11, he says, the Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. I remind you why the Good Shepherd died for the sheep. Every one of your sins was put on His Spirit when he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because Newt Larson's sins, Jeff Frazier's, yours, were put on his back. He cried out, it is finished, and it means it's paid for. Please live that way or start. When you believe in him, that counts for you. Your judgment is taken. There is therefore no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus if you're in Christ. What's more, when you believe in him, oh, this is the most gorgeous truth in the Bible, maybe, tied with many others, his righteousness now covers you. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, who always did right, covers you and your sins, and you're in Christ. Now live this way. Live in combination. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We respond to God's voice through Jesus Christ, starting at Calvary. And if you're not sure of that, start there. 
God shouts at the cross, believe in my son. The Bible is clear that when God speaks, we are to respond with faith and obedience. I give you a very famous verse, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, faith is always based on content. So, how do we respond to the content of God? The clear revelation of God is referred to in Hebrews, and I'll just read it for you, Hebrews 1. I hope you'll look up the most beautiful verses about revelation. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, Old Testament, New Testament. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, He's the radiance of the glory of God, this is Jesus, and the exact imprint of his nature. You see him, you see the Father in the terms of nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Whoa. So that's the revelation of God. That's what we're to respond to. God's word, our part, is to obey right build around faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god he has five verses that say but some of you didn't obey perhaps some of you never put your faith in jesus christ perhaps you never believed god about our responsibility to him we've got to obey him and when it comes to his word to us With creation, we worship all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and let us sing. Oh, praise Him. That's how we started today. If you went to an artist's home and looked at his paintings, surely you would say something. If you looked what she did, you'd say, uh, how did you do that? When a baby is born, don't just say he's really cute or she's really beautiful. Say, that's a gift from God. We respond to creation with worship. We respond to Scripture with, of course, obey it. you got to read it. We respond to Jesus Christ, our Lord, with obedience and trust. Do you believe him? That's the revelation that's so clear. Martin Luther is famous for saying, I'm allowed to quote Martin Luther in this church, aren't I? He's famous for saying, love God and do as you please. But don't take that out of context. He defined love God as you love him and obey him. Then you decide. There was a woman at the chapel who said to me, God tells me things. She said, recently I told God, if you want me to buy that dress and that... You don't know this story. (laughs) True story. If you want me to buy that dress, there would be a parking place in front of the store. I got ready for the rest of the story. She said, there wasn't a parking place the first time, but the second time I went around... (laughs) I said, just buy the dress. God gives us all kinds of decisions, and when we get to heaven, our judgment, 2 Corinthians, is not on our, how much of the voice of God we heard, extra things, but on our choices. That's the issue. And I just urge you, in the area of guidance... Be very careful. I won't judge you if you say God told you to do this. I'll just say, if it's in line with Scripture, if, you know, I read articles. Rick Warren is a wonderful man, I believe. Uh, Fifteen ways you know if it's the voice of God. And when you're done with it, it, you might as well have said, obey the Bible. Because that's what it is about. I had a secretary when I was 19 at a publishing company, and we used to argue about this on breaks. 
not on company time. Here's how she would decide the will of God, the voice of God. Should I go, honest, I'm not exaggerating. Should I go shopping in Fort Wayne? She'd open the Bible somewhere. Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh of all the foreigners who are in among the, I believe I should go. <laughs> it wouldn't say foreigners if it didn't mean somebody from out of town to go to Fort Wayne. It was almost that bad. What about the clear statements that God will guide us? We're to seek wisdom. If you're a pilot, as I said, make the flight plan. If you're driving somewhere, decide how to get there. We will be judged on the basis of our decisions. God can speak to any believer, any person, confirming things, but the commands that are clear are to obey the commands that are clear. Do that, and then make wise choices based upon the Scriptures or what you feel in your intuition or what you feel is the voice of God, but it will never go against what is clearly taught. A friend of mine from Moody recently wrote an article in Christianity Today. It was so well written. He's a wonderful, godly man. As far as I know, I get close to him a little bit at particular events. And the whole article was about intuition. But if your intuition and your conscience is not trained by the Scriptures and all the areas of wisdom that God has given us, obeying Jesus Christ, please don't ever listen to what you're thinking. His intuitions come out of the Scriptures and come out of His life of obedience. So, yes, of course God can do that. Some people misuse that. The Holy Spirit indwells us. It's not a dormant thing. It's an alive thing, but it's not like he tells us everything we're to do. He confirms. He bears witness with me when we sang that song about worship and about Jesus Christ, my shepherd. He points out sin in our lives all the time. He can guide us on decisions, but we pray and we use his word and then we make decisions in line with everything that has already been revealed. In the rearview mirror, friends, you look back and you see God shepherding. Yes, he shepherds us. Janine and I dated for three years. It was a difficult decision. I know we all, we both had, not all of us, there were just two of us, in the back of our mind, should we marry? But looking back, it was such a good decision. God was shepherd. That was true in so many areas of church life for you and for me and personal life. But we clearly obey everything here. Love God and do as you please means obey him everywhere here and then make choices. Will you do that? And then go to bed. Don't worry about it. God will be so loving and kind that if you're obeying this and following the example of Jesus Christ and worshiping him in your personal life, I don't think you can make a mistake if you'll do all that. And where we differ on what is the voice of God and what is my brilliantly, yours too, brilliantly created conscience given by God, trained by the Scriptures and by other Christians, when we obey that conscience, God guides us that way too. When Jesus died on the cross, he said something to his friends that they would pass on to Chapel Street and to me and all of us. And through Paul, his inspired writer, he said, when you take that bread at communion, it's my body. Now his body was right there, so the bread was a symbol of his body. And we believe that when we eat that in a moment, we're saying, I believe in him. I received Jesus into my life, and we live like this. 
When you take the cup, a picture of his blood, you're saying as you drink it, there's no other way I could ever be forgiven except through the blood of Jesus Christ, his death. Is that you? If you're sure of that in Christ, celebrate communion and say, this bread that we eat together, wait till we all get it and we'll eat it together, is a picture that God came into the earth through Jesus Christ to die for me. When you drink the cup, you're saying, I believe his death is totally sufficient, no question. Be sure. And then go out of here to live life with the freedom of choice in many areas, Christian liberty, but clear teaching on the things that God counts as very important right here and in the example of Jesus Christ. And when you look at the sky, go, ah. Let's pray. How great you are, Lord. Your name is above all names. You made the world's can I say, with a flick of your wrist, with a word of your power. You hold them together in Jesus Christ. He holds all things together. Oh! And you've given us conscience and wisdom and shepherding, and we give you thanks. As you pray, not out loud but quietly, give God thanks for his shepherding in your life, even in hard times. Pray for his wisdom to choose carefully and to obey his clear voice in Scripture and in Christ and in your conscience. If you've never put your faith in Christ, why not take communion for the first time as a sure believer and pray something like this. From this day on, I place my faith in Jesus Christ and believe that all my sins were judged in him. I believe in him as Lord and Savior. I turn from my sin to trust him from now on. And I will take communion to celebrate. Thank you, God, for hearing us together. Quietly pray as you reflect on the death of Jesus Christ at this moment.